In this module, let's start to look at how we get data in and out of storage. This isn't really a hardware course, but you need to know some of the basics about how this works to help you do performance tuning. Now, before we go in any deeper, all through this module and the whole class, I've been using things like the engine. The engine is actually a lot of complex moving parts, just like your cars is. The query processor is what designs execution plans to work well for your query and then executes those plans, getting the different indexes and types of data that it needs out. There's a separate part of the engine called the storage engine. And this is what goes off and gets these pages into RAM and after we change them, pushes them back down to disk safely, hopefully safely. Also manages things like backups. So in order to understand how this works, let's take a couple of quick tours through a select query and then a delete, update, and insert query. Now I'm going to use the world's simplest diagram of SQL Server engines. All we have at the end of the day is really the end user who sends in queries to SQL Server. I don't really care how long this takes. The end user can take their time building the query, but once they punch execute, then the CPU is going to start working. That's where SQL Server is running on. That code in SQL Server, it's going to first try and get the data from cache, but if it's not in cache, we're going to have to get it off of disk. This is where the storage engine comes in. It translates our requests for pages into requests out to the storage engine, or to the uh, uh, hard drives and solid state drives. The storage engine is what starts to look at how many queries are going simultaneously, how can we get all of the pages in in a way that will satisfy everyone's queries, because remember, we only have so much RAM, and we have to intelligently manage that. Plus, at the same time, it's also trying to execute out writes. So we have to make sure we're not trying to read data that someone else is also trying to write at the exact same time. Now, once our query's in RAM, or once our data's in RAM, as we're working through it, we're then sketching things out into TempDB, making lists. Of course, all of our data doesn't have to be in RAM at the exact same time. We may be reading through some pages, making a list in TempDB, reading some more pages, continuing on with our list. Finally, when that whole shebang is done, then we push the data back out to the end user. But as you look back at this graph, think about where we're dealing with raw data pages. We're dealing with the exact same raw data pages in memory or on disk. If someone, one of these users, say Jeff Atwood, ID number one, decides to update his record, the storage engine doesn't go pluck one row off of disk, it pulls Jeff's page off of disk. Same thing with select queries. The storage engine really works the same way, whether we're getting to modify the data or just getting it for selects. We're going to work in units of whole pages, or even more than that, more on that in a second. So let's explore that, uh, say that Jeff Atwood decides to change his name, well not his name, let's say his location. He moves from El Cerrito, California. The first thing that happens is the user sends in the query. The application says update, you know, ID number one, set location equals New York City or wherever. New York City! So SQL Server then needs to get not just Jeff's row into cache, but all of the related data. Because remember, we have other indexes here. We have clustered, and uh, we have uh, not just the clustered, but a couple of other non-clustered indexes as well. We have to figure out where those live and get them all into memory. Plus, if you have any triggers or referential integrity, if you have any fields that say, well, this one has to have a matching parent in this other table and we can't make any changes, we've got to get all of that into memory because we're going to need to take a lock on it. More on that in a second. Now, if it's not in memory, we're going to have to fetch it off of disk. Typically with update, delete, insert queries, we're talking about small groups of pages, unless you're that guy who says update and you don't put the where clause in there or you forget to highlight it. I know! I saw you do it! But aside from that, under regular operations, we're going to be grabbing just small groups of pages. So it's, we're not talking about long, sprawling disk accesses here unless we don't have indexes to match. Because if I say, find all the users where display name equals Jeff Atwood and change his city, and I don't have an index on display name, I'm screwed. I might end up locking all of this. More on that in a, another module to come. 
So while this thing is working, while we're doing our deletes, updates, and inserts, I'm going to have to grab locks on these data because I don't want anybody else locking this data while I'm working on it. You know what else is interesting is I also need something called a schema stability lock. No one can be changing my table while I'm working. If someone needs to add a column to this table, they have to wait until I'm done. I'm working here. Same thing with select queries, even for that matter. If someone is running a select query against a table, even with no lock, they're going to get a schema stability lock, meaning no one can change this table as long as I'm working. Now, once I've got all the locks that I need and I'm ready to change that data, the data gets written to the log file synchronously. No, 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 not this, the log file. SQL Server is going to log exactly what it wants to do, and it'll change the data pages. But what's interesting is that the transaction is considered committed before these data pages are written to disk. This is why the log file is so incredibly important, because you could log the changes that you're about to make. The user gets an OK that their transaction committed, but this stuff is still in RAM and somebody yanks the power cord on the server. Gone. When SQL Server starts up and you see things like recovering or, you know, the database is slowly rolling things forward, it's fixing all of the stuff that's in the transaction log but hasn't been changed on disk. The data pages never made it out to disk. You wouldn't want the data file changes to be written simultaneously, the synchro synchronously, because you're probably making lots of changes to the same pages on disk. Think about a table with an identity field, like our users table. If we're always adding users, I might keep the tail end of this table, the last page, where all of our users are getting added. I keep them in cache at all time, and we're just adding more records onto the end of this, and every 60 seconds, I can flush this thing out to disk. I don't have to worry about losing changes because that stuff made it to disk in the log file. And then we can just batch these out at a less important time. For the longest time, there was all this advice around your log files need to be on completely separate spindles from your data files because the log file access is synchronous. It's all in a row. We're writing sequentially to it. One, two, three, four, five, all these things. You don't want to mix that up with the data file, which just gets batched out all over the place because we're doing updates all over the disk. In reality, that's not how modern storage works. In modern storage, you're dealing with a SAN with lots of people all piled up on the same uh, groups of spindles, or you're dealing with hundreds of databases on the same exact server, and they're all active at a time. You put them all on the same log file drive, right? That's all random now because everybody's jumping around all over the place. This concept of random access, though, does have an interesting side effect, fragmentation. Think about doing deletes, updates, and inserts on your pages. So the pages that we have here, say that I delete half of these records because these people decided to unsubscribe or whatever. They wanted to take away all their stuff without a trace. I would have half empty space on these pages because it's not like I can go back and insert new people in the same place. My clustered index is on an identity field. I am always adding people to the end of that index, not somewhere in the middle. Same thing that's interesting with update statements. Remember Jeff Atwood was going to change his city from El Cerrito, California. What if he moves to Chapatulas, Louisiana, or something else with an extremely long name? There's not enough space left here on the page to perform that update. We packed it in as tightly as we could. So what does SQL Server do in that case? Well, if I have a fixed page that's all completely full and I need some space, I tear the page. I put some of the data on one 8K page and some of the data on another 8K page. This involves some locking, because now I'm locking just not my own records, but other people on the same page. Plus, it affects the B tree, the underlying structure that says where each record can be found at, if I need to seek directly to row number 100 or whatever. So for a long time, people were worried about this as a very expensive operation, page splits, dangerous, slow, whatever. And then as I split these across, 
there probably wasn't a page right next to this one for me to lay down half of the records because my data is all packed in as tightly as I can. I may have to put some of these way out somewhere else on storage so that if I'm scanning along through all my clustered index pages, they're going to be scattered around all over the disk. These are the two kinds of fragmentation, and they're totally different. Internal fragmentation means I've got pages that are half empty because I either deleted records or I had to do page splits. So each one of these pages is less dense. Even though it's still on an 8K page, it doesn't have as many records. And remember, the smallest unit that I do of cache or disk access is these 8K pages. So if I'm going to cache these in RAM, I'm effectively wasting some of my RAM because I'm caching empty space in memory. It's not like half-used pages take up half as much RAM. The minimum a page will take on these is 8K. SQL Server doesn't care whether they're full or empty. The second part of that is external fragmentation. Are all these pages in a row, or are they scattered around on disk? Now, this isn't as important in memory, because if you think about it, all memory access is random anyway. Our tables are going to be scattered all throughout RAM. SQL Server doesn't have a concept of defragging RAM to put our tables together in one area. External fragmentation does matter for different reasons. And we need to kind of zoom out and think about what this means. First off, if we're dealing with targeted index queries, if I'm saying, get me, like we work so hard on in our non-clustered index course, get me the ID, display name, and age of the users where the ID equals 45, and I know I'm going to zoom right down to one particular row and get it out, who cares about fragmentation? The data needs to be in memory anyway, and then it's going to be blazing fast. And if it isn't in memory, I'm not doing OLTP correctly. If I have to constantly go back and hit disk every time I need a row off of there, I'm going to be screwed no matter what. My users are not going to be happy. I know it's kind of a tough love kind of question. We talk about that more in our hardware modules, why you can't scale OLTP when you have to hit storage every time. External fragmentation, having the pages out of order, doesn't really matter much because this stuff's in RAM anyway. But if we have to do big, long table scans, if I have to shuffle through thousands or millions of pages, then fragmentation starts to matter. Both internal and external start to matter. SQL Server has some really cool tricks. For example, in Enterprise Edition, instead of just asking for one or two pages at a time from storage, or even eight pages at a time, like Standard Edition will do, Standard Edition, well, both of them work in groups of eight 8K pages called an extent. So they'll typically try and grab a whole extent off of storage, but Enterprise Edition will go even higher than that. Under some conditions, it will ask for as much as 512K in a row from storage, going, hey, dude, I'm going to scan this whole user's table. Just keep them coming. I've done a lot of work to make sure these tables are all laid out in order. Keep giving them to me as fast as you can, because I'm going to rip through all of them really quickly in order to pull off my query. Now, if you do put a lot of work into defragmentation, and you spend a lot of money in Enterprise Edition, those tricks will work but not nearly as well as index tuning and caching the database in RAM. But I'm going to set that aside for a second, because there's something is really cool in Enterprise Edition that I don't think gets enough press, and it's called merry-go-round scans. Say that you've got a table of sales data, and it's one terabyte. And we don't have one terabyte of RAM in our SQL Server. We have 128 gigs, let's just say. And I start a query where I'm going to start marching through my table, reading all of the data. I start at the beginning and I go all the way through to the end because I'm one of those users who's running a query that there's no index to support. So we're going to have to scan it all even though I don't need it all. I said just where the order ID equals 45 and we have no index on order ID. Well, as my query is trucking right along through all of this data, all the stuff that I already saw, the things I saw in the first, say, 128 gigs of the table, those are gone from memory. We don't have enough memory to cache this entire t sales table all at once, so we're flushing it out as we go along merrily. Now, unfortunately, you start a query while mine is running 
I don't know about. Unfortunately, you're not a bad person. I don't mind if you run a query at the same time, although you really, I really wish you'd let me have the server to myself. So anyway, SQL Server recognizes that there's two queries hitting the same table at the same time, even though they have nothing to do with each other. You have a different WHERE clause than I do. You have different join orders. We have nothing in common. I never really liked you. Well, you're OK, because you're learning about SQL Server. But SQL Server recognizes and lets the two of us go along hand in hand, happily dancing through the table, reading the same pages at the same time, and using just one set of reads to satisfy both queries. Now, when my query gets to the end of the table, I'm out of here. I've already gotten all the data that I need. SQL Server Enterprise Edition is smart enough to say, OK, here's the portion of the table that you missed, because Brent's query started earlier. We'll just go back and scan that part for you. This is how you can scale large databases, things that are way too big in RAM, and still be able to satisfy lots of simultaneous end user queries without running into trouble. This is not how standard edition works. Each of them will be making their own scattered, tiny requests to storage. You know how sometimes your SAN administrator says, I don't understand. The SAN's sitting around bored. It must be a SQL Server problem. Sometimes it is, especially if we're using standard edition and data that's way too big to fit in RAM. So to recap what we talked about during uh, this particular module, first off, for select statements, if we're doing small targeted index seeks, just grabbing a few pages at a time, and we go to the work to make sure they're cached in memory, we're not going to have a lot of storage problems. If we're going to be doing big, long index scans, hitting the whole entire table and we don't have enough memory to cache it, Enterprise Edition has a few tricks but it's nowhere near as good as putting your time into index tuning and making sure that the smallest possible subset of the database can fit in RAM rather than going off and hitting disk. This is one of the reasons why we talk about in the index tuning classes by Kendra why you don't want to have too many indexes because as you do inserts, updates, and deletes, you have to cache all of those in RAM every time you're doing an insert, update, or delete and then you end up pushing out other indexes that wish they could be in RAM. Ooh, sorry, so too bad. For delete updates and insert uh, queries, on the other hand, the log file has to make it to disk uh, synchronously, but I don't really care how long the data file takes in order to respond. This is why often some systems like, say, the fast track data warehouse reference architecture tell you that it's OK to do data files on RAID 5, because the write, write speed for data files isn't nearly important as the speed of select queries. So hopefully now you can start turning in some of this knowledge into understanding how storage works as well. See you in the next module.